Hello, everyone, and welcome. Today, we are in the last of the series of eight webinars in the Aim for Inclusion with OTAP webinar series. Today, we'll be talking about inclusive education in Oregon, exploring resources to empower access for all learners. And I, I debated, I wanted to come before the word inclusive and type in big red letters, meaningful inclusion because we don't want to bring our kids into the classroom for the world to pass them by. We want to make sure that they are active participants in their education and in their dreams. So uh, we are uh, OTAP, the Oregon Technology Ac Access Program, a uh, grant from the Oregon Department of Education. And today we wear hats from the Oregon AIM cohort. And I am Deb Fitzgibbons. It is my pleasure to welcome you and host you today. I am the coordinator of the Oregon Technology Access Program and regional and statewide services for students with orthopedic impairment. And I have been the uh, somewhat leader of the Oregon AIM cohort. We are now in our fourth year, and it is my pleasure to um, facilitate or co-facilitate with Tony Nickel today. Tony, would you like to take a moment to introduce yourself? Sure. I am um, obviously an occupational therapist. I have worked uh, throughout all Northeast Oregon pretty much. There's a couple places I haven't hit, but not too many. And um, I have also really enjoyed being on the AIM cohort and have learned a lot and continue to learn a, a lot. When I uh, work with my students, um, I've been telling them, I think I learn as much from them as they're learning from me. And so it's been a really fun process and continues to uh, just grow every day. So very fun. Excellent. So glad to be with you. And Chandra uh, is again, I'm going to call her what she is. She's the glue that holds us together. So she'll be sharing links and uh, monitoring the chat box for us. And uh, Tony, uh, again with Baker, is one of the uh, schools, the pilot districts that has been part of our AIM cohort um, for the last four years. So we've been working through these things together. So um, we are in partnership uh, with the National Center on Accessible Educational Materials. Again, this is our fourth year um, we have been working with them. They are the CAS, the AIM Center on the East Coast, and uh, we have developed plans and they are there to help us. You'll notice from this little map that Oregon is the only state uh, west of the Mississippi that is um, a part of this cohort. So we are representing loud and proud. I also want to say that when we look at the big picture of where we are on the national level and bring it to the state level and down to you and your students, that we are calling attention to the National Education Technology Plan just came out in January. And uh, it's another justification on why we're doing is so important. Now, the EdTech plan uh, calls out the digital use divide, making sure that we're giving opportunities to our students who use technology to use them in dynamic ways, not just keeping people busy but making sure that the use of the technology is meaningful. Also, uh, the digital design divide, addressing opportunities for educators to expand their own knowledge. And we know that that's difficult sometimes when you're in a state that has so many mountains in the middle. So that's why we're really glad to be able to bring to you virtual opportunities. And the digital access divide, uh, making sure there's digital uh, access for all of our kids, regardless of location including connectivity, devices, content, and all three of these divide areas are ones that we're working on because technology does have the potential to uh, help our students to overcome barriers. You'll notice in the EdTech plan that there's many mentions of universal design, of AIM, and of assistive technology. So bringing that to the state level, we are focused in supporting the message from ODE, which is one of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And we are here to say that you cannot have any of those if you don't ensure that access is provided for all kids up front. Now, we know that sometimes access is about the demographics and uh, the ethnicity, et cetera. 
But today we're just going to remind you of the accessible definition that we are using. And this uh, slide is, should become familiar to you uh, if you've been through any of our webinars. Uh, today, again, we're number eight, but all of the webinars are going to be, you're going to be able to go back and experience them, and we're going to show you how. But accessible means that a person with a disability can acquire, engage, and enjoy the same information, uh, interactions, and services. And this is key in an equally effective, equally integrated manner with substantially equivalent ease of use. We don't want them to have to jump through all kinds of hoops because they require something different. And same as a person without a disability. So that's what we're talking about. And theme accessible educational materials. And this definition comes from the National uh, AIM Center. You'll find their uh, mark all the way through our presentations and our materials because of course they have been supporting us. Accessible educational materials are print and technology-based educational materials that includes printed and electronic textbooks. And that's new from when it used to be A, accessible instructional materials, because now all the electronic and digital materials are also included. But it's in that they are converted or designed. Sometimes you're going to purchase them up front. And that's the best way, because then you have it for all students. If we're not considering and purchasing up front, then we're coming back and retrofitting them for kids who may need um, a, the format for a, what we have known as a print disability, those who can have difficulty accessing uh, because of fine motor, because of vision, and or because of comprehension and reading difficulties. So these are the conversations, these are the um, vocabulary definitions that we are moving forward with. So when we began our AIM cohort, we certainly were looking at bringing people from different uh, groups across our state to make sure that we had uh, really considered a system. So our first goal was to create a coordinated system for the equitable and timely provision of AIM supports across the lifespan. So that, of course, means that we wanted to have all of the right voices at the table, including those like Tony, who are in the districts, who are working directly front row with our students. We also have folks from uh, the curriculum, statewide curriculum uh, coordinators who've been working with us to make sure that they're closing up those loopholes so that our districts uh, are uh, directed towards materials that are already meeting accessibility guidelines. That was our first goal, a pretty big goal, but we've been working on it for four years. Our second goal was uh, to make sure that we had a communications plan, a place that once we created things and webinars and had uh, resources developed, a place that we could uh, store those that then we could refer to in training so that people can get to them. So we're going to be talking about those today. And our third, and what we really see as the jewel in our crown, um, is the student self-advocacy piece. We talked early on uh, with some of the folks who, are sec uh, who receive our students once they leave uh, secondary education, those such as transition to higher ed and workforce development. And uh, they said that many times students come to them not knowing what they need. And so they kind of have to start all over again. Well, that's not surprising. And there's a lot of reasons that people don't recall or don't know exactly. Part of that is that uh, there might not have been consistency in helping them to learn what they needed. Also, many times uh, people uh, don't realize the importance of the tools and the resources we have given them until they look back and they said they realized that all, life might have been easier if I had uh, picked those up and taken hold of them. But sometimes it's because nobody helped them to discover what it was that they needed. So we developed a, a goal around making sure that we had a plan to help students to learn what they need and to advocate for it and to realize that they're worth it. So we'll be talking about all of these goals today and. Uh, we are the only one of the seven states 
that really took on a self-advocacy goal. So again, we're proud of this and can hardly wait uh, to see this document take life. So our objectives today are always building relationships. If something resonates with you today, we're glad. And we hope that you share that with us. Give us your feedback because uh, we don't want to just be a one and done. We want to make sure that uh, if there are uh, additional sessions that you need, professional development to help you and your team connect the dots, we want to be here for you. So it is all about relationships and collaboration. We want to make sure that you're able to get to the OER Commons, the storehouse for our information. We want you to know how to locate and download the documents we're talking about, including the team guide to AIM in Oregon and the Advocating for My Accessible Educational Materials, the student workbook. And we also want to make sure that you are reflecting and hopefully considering ways that you can use and share these documents with your teams. So goal number one, coordinated system. Well, when we think about providing accessible materials for our learners, that probably sounds to you like something that all students should get. And you're right about that. As we went along and we were planning uh, designing materials, we went back and forth to say, should we be only talking about universal design? Should we be talking about IEP teams? And the answer is yes to all of that. We know that providing materials is that tier one universal support that is going to allow many of our students to access it and then um, may even help them to keep from uh, requiring additional more intensive supports. So universal design, you betcha. But we also know that there are kids who are already um, documented as having a print disability and requiring alternate formats. And those are the kids right in front of us who we need to make sure that everybody is on the same page, that we need to support these kids while we're building the universal design. And so we started with, what are the topics that we would deliver if we were uh, talking about a progression of what our teams should know? And so this is where we started. We started with uh, the, eight se the eight topics in our series. We wanted to make sure that people knew what it was. Common vocabulary. What are the formats that are considered accessible? How does the assistive technology fit into this picture? Why are accessible formats needed? Where can I go to get them? What about teacher-made materials? Does all of this accessibility stuff apply to them? And then after the assessment and you've decided what it is that your student or students need, implementation, making that happen in the classroom. So today we are talking about uh, these uh, resources that we've developed, but we, this is where we started. And so there's a series of webinars that we began. So where are you going to find these webinars? Glad you asked, because they are all housed right in our communications plan, the resource repository, the OER comments. And so I have some slides here that are part of your slide deck that you'll be able to follow along and look at and refer back to. But for right now, I'm going to go ahead and um, go to the OER Commons webpage. Um, and I say webpage, uh, I guess, I think that's what it's called, OER Commons page. Regardless, when you come here for the first time, you will see that there's a spot off to the right here now, if you are working on a smaller screen, if you're looking at it on your phone, uh, and if you don't have the window maximized, you really need to do that because sometimes the sign-in is off in a different spot. But if you have your screen maximized, you'll see the sign-in and registration. But before I go there, let me just point out that you can uh, discover resources, collections. There are groups known as hubs. And our group falls under the hub of Oregon Open Learning. So we're kind of under their umbrella. You're going to see that there are lots of groups. And this isn't just an Oregon thing. These groups are around the country, and I believe there's some international. So 
Also, what you'll see on this front page is that if you're looking for lesson materials, this is open educational resources. So explore, create, and collaborate. So you can put in what subject you're looking for, the level, the standards, and search for materials that then you can take and make your own. So again, the sign-in process, the registration process, just a couple of quick questions, but it's going to allow you then to bookmark your own groups so that you can get to them quickly. So I'm just going to click here and I do have an email. I do have a login. And so I'm just going to go ahead and sign in. And then you will see your own self up here in the corner. And I'm going to go to my group. Now, um, Chandra, if you would drop the link to the OER Commons itself into the chat box. And then the next link she'll be dropping. And if you want to go out to the big picture, the next one will be a direct link to the uh, Oregon uh, Educational uh, or I'm sorry, the Oregon Accessible Educational Materials um, site. So you are going to be able to contribute to this group as well. You'll notice here that it says contribute. So if you have materials that you wanted to upload and to share with us, you could also do that. And there is a process that it goes through for approval. And once that's done, it will be can be part of our uh, resources as well. So when I scroll down, you'll see off to the left, the folders. These are the, what has lovingly been known as buckets of information that we are putting our uh, resources in. Um, you'll see professional development, uh, scrolling down, student advocacy, uh, state assessments. So we are working with the state assessment coordinator for a special, uh, special education. Uh, Mason Rivers has done a really nice session for us recently. IEP guidance transition. We have sessions in here on transition to post-secondary, to higher ed, to workforce development. We have a wonderful session that was done by one of our school librarians in Tiger Tualatin about the intersection of AIM and your school library. Those are the buckets. Now off to the right here, you're going to see some of the resources. As I scroll down, you'll notice that, uh, remember I said we've been working with the uh, curriculum folks at the state level. Well, through our conversations, uh, there's new regulations that really um, help our teams to know uh, and evaluate materials for accessibility. We believe that it's really starting to be on uh, the lips of uh, our uh, people who are purchasing curriculum, trying to make sure that accessibility is considered up front. But you'll see that Ajali Moore, who was in that position for procurement, she and I did a session. You'll see here the book that we're going to be talking about pretty quickly here, the uh, AIM workbook. As I scroll down, you'll see advocacy basics, Access for All, and this is the one I was talking about with the accessibility. You'll be able to search by scrolling through, but if you know a topic, you will also be able to come here and search for it. So I'm just going to type in advocacy. And then of course, what we hope pops up is our advocacy guide. So several topics, things that we've got here. Oh, and I love this last one on this page is the importance of families to understand how AIM can create possibilities. We have family uh, organizations, including Fact Oregon, who just recently delivered this. We hope that you will find uh, videos here that you and your team could explore. They also have handouts with them so that you can review and have professional development of your own. But as you'll see, the uh, processes for um, evaluating, exploring, determining student use for AIM involves a lot of stakeholders, including administrators. So you'll even find a session in here on what administrators need to know. So going back to our page, we have looked at the main page, how to sign in, the contents, and now we're going to go to the first document that we're referring to. And this is our IEP team's guide to AIM in Oregon. Again, we're hoping that 
uh, through all of our uh, hard work and our awareness building that people really start paying attention to the accessibility features when they buy up front. But we wanted to make sure that we had a good document uh, that can guide our teams in the exploration of AIM. Now, when we first started off, we were thinking, well, how big does it need to be? We were looking at things and a lot of the manuals you're going to see these days are 100 pages and plus. And where that may be really thorough, good information, it might also be overwhelming information. So our team really decided uh, to come in and um, come in with a page or a four page document. And so I'm just going to come back here. And remember, I'm going to type in IEP team and I could go a little further than that, but hopefully titles will bring up what we're looking for. And there it is. So once I find this document, then I can open it up. And the next page you'll see, which I also added screenshots to our slideshow for a reminder, but you'll see here a description of the document. You'll see the author, you'll see that it's Creative Commons attribution attribution, it's non-commercial, but it can be shared. That means that it can also be modified for those who need to. Um, you will also find the link here or a spot here where you can do a remix. We're not going to go into that today, but any of the materials that you find on the OER Commons, you can make it your own by saving it and then remixing it to meet your own needs. So here I'm going to go to View Resource, And so you will notice that there are several versions available. And the first is an accessible uh, Word document that you can download. There is also the PDF version accessible. And by accessible, we mean that it can be used and works with any of the assistive technology that someone might be using, such as a screen reader. And so you will also see it in a print version so that this uh, is where you would print that has the exact look of it in addition to the accessible, accessible version. So here I'm just going to click on view and you can certainly download this of course. But when we view and, okay, this is, hmm, I think I'm just going to close this one and go to the, it's not inaccessible, but it is not the one that I am looking for. I'm going to go to this one to view. And this one looks just like the hard copy that you would print out because that's the purpose of it. And so it has all of the highlighting that makes it visually appealing. And so we're going to take a look at page one. Page one is really solidifying the meaning of A. And so you will find a description here and you will also find a link to watch the video, what is A, why does A matter? And when you go back and you look at our series of eight, once we recorded that first video, we added a link. So the link you see here is the video uh, that the very first video that we did in our professional development. Of course, you'll also see a QR code. QR codes are great for us because they help take us there quickly. You might also imagine that our students who have difficulty with typing in uh, URLs and, and navigating to pages, QR codes can be really helpful, a time saver. So again, that familiar, um, familiar, definition that we're working with. And moving down, watch educational materials. Here's another link. The POUR principles, that's P-O-U-R. That stands for, here we go, perceivable. Everybody can see it. Operable. Everybody can navigate to it using their preferred methods and their tools, and it's interoperable with their technology, that it's understandable that understanding is supported through consistent and predictable design. And the last one here, robust, that's P-O-U-R, R is robust. It can be operated on a range of technologies and is uh, fully um, used in the classroom. 
So we've got uh, information here that really solidifies what AIM is. So that's page one. What is it? With links to documents or, and videos that can help you deepen your understanding. So when we think about the kids that we work with, we know there's lots of decisions that are going to be made. Does this student um, require alternative formats? Well, there's some questions, some probing questions here. Determine, is this student having difficulty with their materials? What format are we going to use? What supports are we going to need? Does anybody need to be trained? The student, the team, the parents, the family, looking at all of the pieces and parts to make sure that it is uh, you're making good decisions. So again, who are the students who require AIM? We know that some of the students are on IEPs or 504 plans, so that's a given. Um, but when we purchase up front, again, we make sure that all of the students who require it have it. But also for those of us who just prefer to listen to something, I can turn on the screen reader when material is accessible. So you're also going to be able to highlight, et cetera. If I go to a copier and just make a copy and send it to myself, <coughs> all I have is a picture. So making sure that we have done our due diligence to ensure that we know that there's going to be some, somebody coming to our class who requires it. So we don't want to wait until they get there. We want to plan up front. And one of the tools that you'll find is the AIM Navigator, and this is on the uh, AIM Center website. <clears throat> and it can take you through those conversations about the decisions. Getting the right format, how do we integrate it? Again, the, the links and the QR codes that you see are ones that we actually uh, created the webinar, delivered it, recorded it. And this is one here that you see what is accessibility, acquire, engage, enjoy. That is one that our cohort member, Jennifer South, did for us back in November. So we have supports for you to know and get just a little bit more than the definition. Next page that we move to, page three, is consideration and documentation in the student plan. Most typically, that's going to be the IEP, but there are exceptions. So if you have not seen an IEP that has factor G, um, most of them in Oregon do. <coughs> Excuse me. There are, uh, there's really just one uh, that doesn't, but regardless of whether your IEP shows factor G or not, it doesn't relieve the district of its responsibility to provide it. Uh, if you look at some of the other uh, sessions that we did, you're going to see the legislation and the, the regulations that mandate uh, that we deliver it in a timely manner. And that means at the same time as their peers. We didn't focus on legislation here, but explore the other uh, webinars that are in our resource. And you'll find more information about that. So what are some of the uh, agencies that provide guidance? Uh, here's the consideration of documentation. This one was uh, recorded, I believe, in April. Um, there are pieces that you can share with your team. This is a great document. Print it out. <coughs> and uh, the, then you'll see at the bottom of this page, you'll see two case studies. One um, is Maya. One is Jebron. They are uh, talking about uh, their sit own situations and it gives something for you to work through with your team and with the student to help them to understand um, the what is intended whenever you put together a student plan. So a couple of samples in there, again, with links and QR codes. And the last page is where can you go for help when you need to phone a friend? We know that your first resource is going to be in your own backyard. So your local educational uh, service agency. Finding the aim to meet student goals is the session that was recorded by Wendy Burkhardt out in High Desert. And this will link you to that. But really considering and going to your own team and your own resources first, and then looking at the bigger picture. When we think about our resources here, we have uh, the the curriculum folks have a page 
for Accessible Materials at ODE, that is linked here. OTAP. OTAP is a great place to uh, contact and we can help you in your search and your education, your professional development. There is the Instructional Materials Toolkit and the newest version is just out there we've been taking a look at. And I think that we all know that the digital piece is really going to be crucial for taking us into the future. We've been working with paper for a long time. And some of our districts have gone back to paper after COVID. But in order for us to really make sure that our materials are accessible and that our kids have the tools to use them, we know that in uh, digital, instructional, accessible digital is in important. So the Oregon Open Learning Hub, the Textbook Media Center. So if you are someone who needs to furnish um, Braille, for instance, First of all, Braille takes a long time to acquire or to, um, to transcribe. And the OTMC uh, will do all of that work for you. We put a link to the accessibility manual for testing, as well as additional places that you can go for support. So in a nutshell, those four pages are the document the team, uh, your team will need uh, and share um, to get the basics of A. So going back to our slideshow, um, reminding you that there are a variety of formats for you to choose from. And just a wonderful short document. Now, when we think about what are the primary points that we want you to get out of the IEP document, well, when AIM is meaningfully incorporated into a student's IEP, not just checking a box, yes or no, but really thinking about how is this student going to use it and having a plan for implementation and integration, the likelihood is increased that the student's use of AIM, what was that again? Accessible educational materials. Is it starting to roll off your tongue? It will you too will be an AIM evangelist. You'll become an effective and integrated part of the learning process in K-12 and beyond because the team knows what the student needs. The other point that uh, we wanted to make here is that where it appears, where you document AT and AIM in the IEP, IEP is not as important as being sure that it's included in a way that makes sense to those who implement it, but it's understandable. We know that across our state, there might be some inconsistency across districts on, on the ins and outs and the logistics of where and exactly how it's documented. But this is what is important, that it is clear that if my student now needs to move to the other side of the state, that they're going to be able to pick up and implement the same strategies and tools with the student as we had here. So making sure that there is a clear plan and then everybody knows about it. And again, the resources, where you're going to go, uh, always feel free to contact us and we can help connect you to the resources that you need. <clears throat> so to the student self-advocacy piece, the most important piece of our work. We knew that uh, students, yes, we are responsible for making sure that our students have a, but as we go along, helping students to understand that uh, what their, pro their plan is, what works for them, helping them to discover that and to practice integrating it and advocating for it. This is really where we wanted to focus. <coughs> Excuse me again. So back into the OER Commons, you'll see View Resource. And you'll also note that this document, the accessible uh, accessibility guide for students is also available in EPUB, digital, print, and it says here print for it because it is a pretty hefty size book and it has to have a certain layout to present in or to print in the right order. So that's what this one is for. And you'll see in the lower left hand corner here that we now have a BRF that's a braille ready format that's all ready for someone to emboss and have in a braille uh, format for any student who requires that. This is kind of rare. 
to have this document out here for anybody to use. We're grateful to the Northwest Regional ESD. Their team there uh, did a wonderful job of um, converting this and, and making it available for our students. You may realize that often our students with visual impairments and braille needs are the last ones considered for accessibility. We didn't want to do that. We wanted to consider them up front. So we make sure that they have what they need. Advocating for my accessible educational materials, an AIM guide for students. We got input from a lot of people. We, uh, the team went out and did some research to see is there anything out there that already exists? And the answer was no. There was some things about advocacy related to particular a disability diagnosis related to assistive technology, but the team really started from scratch with a few ideas um, for this particular uh, manual. Who's the target audience? Well, we wanted to make sure that we could reach students younger. We didn't want to start with the high school so that they are uh, that they are getting it whenever they're leaving. We wanted to start it back here, more in the middle school level, so that they had time to practice with it. You'll notice that it looks a bit more like a comic book, and that's what we wanted. Anything that was all text was not going to be as engaging for the kids. And so you'll see that, yes, it really goes from about the maybe fifth grade up to about the eighth or ninth grade, but you're also going to find application for it in high school and um, some great conversations to come out of. So we know, and one of the frameworks that we were using is the teachable elements of self-determination. And that comes from, let me see if I can move on my toolbars aside, that comes from Waymar 2007. And so the teachable skills that we were looking at and we wanted to make sure kids have were choice-making skills, decision-making skills, problem-solving skills, tools that all of our kids need, goal-setting, attainment, self-regulation, self-management, self-advocacy and leadership. And again, these are skills that we hope all of our students leave us with. The ability to be an active participant in one's own life. We're hoping that these are the outcomes of the student advocacy guide. On top of that, our document, our uh, guide guidance, our workbook is timely. There is uh, something new coming down the pike for self-advocacy in Oregon. And you'll see that Senate Bill 3 um, passed uh, updating the high school uh, diploma requirements in Oregon's high schools. Beginning with the class of 2027, the Oregon diploma requirements will include a half credit in personal financial education and a half credit in higher ed and career pass skills as part of their requirements. Now, the public, uh, my toolbar, the public comment higher education and career pass skills, notice here, that uh, seeking assistance and self-advocacy is part of what our students are expected, will be expected to learn uh, before they graduate. So our document hopefully is one that can fall in line to be a tool uh, for kids. Um, and we're hoping to have this be part of the, um, meet the requirement for self-advocacy. Still working on that, but stay tuned. So as we, work through the document, and Tony's going to take us on a look for that through the document. As we work through that, think about your own particular um, environment. Now, some of you are working directly face-to-face -face with students, and so you know what makes them tick. But sometimes our administrators have a bigger picture view, and <coughs> when we think about the, what the students are, what the profile is that's coming to our classroom right now, I think that one of the things that we're going to uh, see is that there is a lot of chronic absenteeism. Is that happening in your area? Post COVID, some of our kids are not coming back to the classroom with engagement and enthusiasm. Part of that could be that they don't feel like the classroom is supporting them. They don't feel that sense of belonging. 
And we have found that when you make sure that kids have everything they need to access the curriculum, that we're not the gatekeepers of information. You don't have to fail before you get more intensive support and somebody gives you something digitally. That's just making our kids jump through more hoops when all they need is more support. But think about whether your students would agree with you on where they're at. So these are gonna be some great conversations. Tony, I know you noticed another area um, that is pretty prominent in our classrooms right now. And uh, talk just a moment about that as you lead us into um, exploring this document. Well, I can only talk about our district, um, but we're seeing a lot more issues with behaviors and challenges with kids who are struggling to self-regulate and maintain their behavior so that they can stay in the classroom. We're seeing students that have elopement issues and difficulty maintaining their attention long enough to complete a task or being able to integrate, stay integrated in a classroom so that they can be just an active participant in with the rest of their peers. And when they don't have the support that they need through some of these uh, wonderful things that we've uh, developed, then they're not gonna be engaged. And when they're not engaged, that's kind of when we lose them. And I have found that um, some of these things are really making a difference for some of our students, for sure. Uh, so when we started this, this has been probably one of the most fun projects that I've done in my career. Um, we had to decide who are we writing this uh, guide for? Are we writing it for teachers? Are we writing it for students? And we actually determined that we didn't want to have one for students and one for teachers. We wanted to have one guide. Um, so we started out with uh, having information not only for teachers, but also for parents. Um, I have been working with this guide the last couple weeks and yesterday met with a student and said, now, have you shown this to your parent or to your mom or dad yet? And she said, no. And I said, well, I think you should, you know, that would be a good opportunity for them to know what kind of things that you need and how you're using them. But as teachers, uh, depending on how we decide to use this guide, uh, we need to know what's in it and how we can use it best. So we start out with some information for those that are going to be guiding our students through this um, through this guidebook. And then we kind of jump right in and give a message to students so that they know what is going to be in this uh, this workbook and how they're going to be using it. So after we go through the table of contents, our next page will be just a definition of what is self-advocacy. And not every one of my students really can actually define what that is. And so it gives us an opportunity to talk about what is self-advocacy, why it's important to be able to advocate for yourself, and what I have learned, too, is that it is not something that just comes naturally. I actually kind of feel sorry for students who don't get an opportunity to use this guide because that is a skill that we use throughout our, our entire life. I, being an occupational therapist, I think that it's a life skill to know how to work um, with others and ask for what we need, recognize what we need, and then ask for it in a way that you're gonna get the response that you want. And if you don't, then what do you do? So uh, we go through that and recognize that even though um, you may know exactly what you're asking for, those on your team may not know and they may not understand what you need. That's one of the uh, points about starting kind of with a middle school range of student. That's about the time when they have different teachers and they don't just have one certain homeroom teacher and they need to learn how to ask for what they need um, with a variety of different personality types and knowing how to use uh, those wonderful skills of um, collaboration and how they can be helpful. So we define what is self-advocacy. And then we go through being able to uh, 
recognize what you're going to be able to do when you're finished with this. You're going to know how to set goals. You're going to learn how to advocate for what you need. You're going to learn how to make sure that you can operate the technology and um, be able to use and um, manage those materials. And some of the students that we've started working um, with with this guide aren't even aware that some of the things that they're using are uh, something that maybe not everyone has, or they're not aware of what's available to them. So it's a great opportunity to jump in and define what self-advocacy is and why they need to, to learn this. So as we go through the guide, um, they're gonna learn how to be able to do those things and, and uh, be kind of self-actualized in the process. They're not gonna need someone the rest of their life to be able to do this for them. So that's a, an awesome way to give kids confidence and know how to uh, be able to manage other areas in their life potentially as well that they're gonna need to ask for help. Um, we have actually thought about using a lot of these principles in other areas of our students' lives as well um, as, as um, in their aim, but then learning this in this level, they can kind of transfer that knowledge to other areas. So as we go along, um, there is an excellent questionnaire that they go through. I just did it for the first time using the digital version today. I've always done it with the paper copy, but we did it with the visual or the digital version today. And that was really fun for me. I thought that was really cool to be able to check that off. I emailed the document to my student ahead of time and then we went through the questionnaire. So um, as they go through the different statements, they're gonna know whether or not that describes them. Is that something that they can do independently? They don't really need any help for that. Or maybe they're still kind of working on that skill or uh, that ability and they're still working on it, but they might need some help sometimes, or that's not me. This is not something that I'm able to do yet or I feel comfortable with yet. So I kind of like this little visual to kind of help uh, them see that a little bit better. And so it gives them some flexibility so that they can kind of figure out where they're at. I've had students that have been all in the that's not me section, and then we know what kind of work we need to do. But I'm starting to see more and more of our students that are kind of have a mix throughout that um, those three categories. So the first section is about goal setting. The next section is about self-advocacy using their, their accessible materials. The next section is operating their technology, which is a piece that sometimes they help me with. So I'm learning as much from them as they are from me, uh, if not more. And then the last section is how to use and manage their materials. So I like the way it's organized. It's not quite so overwhelming when it's kind of organized like that, especially for some of our kids that need that extra structure as they uh, access those, um, those skills. So after they complete uh, this questionnaire, this is, as I always say, this is my favorite part of the document. Um, Deb kind of alluded to this earlier. We all need people in our corner to support us. We all need someone that when we have uh, an issue that maybe doesn't quite go right, that we can go to and they will give us some support. But we also need someone for when it does go right and they will cheer us on and we can cheer together. And there's opportunities for them to recognize um, who their uh, supporters are. And uh, as I've gone through this with students, their list of supporters are increasing too, as they start to recognize um, who they can go to when they need that extra help. Um, and it gives that ability for them to have that contact information so that they know exactly who, that, who it is that they can go to. But I think this is very, very um, important. And I wasn't sure if I was going to mention this today or not, but I'm going to jump in and do it because one of my students yesterday was her first time to go and uh, self-advocate for herself with one of her general ed teachers. And uh, it did not go well for her. The teacher was caught at the wrong time and didn't respond exactly the way that she had hoped she would. So boy, that is the time when that circle of support is so needed. And she has two or three people that are gonna help her work through that. Plus she's gonna learn what to do the next time to maybe schedule an appointment before she just walks up to that teacher 
or make sure that she goes up with the right person to, to support her. So this is like a very important part of the document um, in, my, in my opinion. So after our circle of support, we can consider who all those different people are and they might be just our family or our friends. They might be um, people who are uh, teachers or teammates. In the process of doing this, we're talking about who is on your IEP team or your 504 team, who is there to be able to support you. And some of them have never really considered that. I've also had teachers find out that they were listed as a student's uh, circle support, which has been very affirming for those educators as well. So I just think this is a real positive spin on uh, this part of our guide and one of my favorite parts. So as we move forward, um, there is an opportunity to look at a couple of different stories where students um, had to use this guide and help themselves be a little more uh, independent in knowing what they needed or advocating for themselves. The first one is a story of May and she's a seventh grader. And I believe that the stories that uh, are, are in this guidebook have some basis in reality and some actual stories. So that makes them uh, really important. And so th this student, May, goes through and she recognizes that she doesn't have everything that she needs. And so she kind of troubleshoots and figures out what she does need and uh, figures out how to make a plan and set some goals for what she needs for her aim. And so that's helpful for, I think, our students to see how other kids have used the guide and kind of gives them a... Uh, just a place to move forward from. Then after the story, it lists May's um, actual, um, let's see on the next page, I guess I'm not sure if that one's on there. Yeah, her profile. And it has her pri profile filled out, but then there's a profile that they can use. So as I was filling out profiles with students, I referred back to May's profile to see how she answered some of her questions or some of her um, issues. And so she has this profile that kind of helps her delineate what kind of formats she needs and where and when she needs them. Is it just for class? It might be for some after school activities that she needs them for. She might need them at home. Um, and then which formats are helpful, what kind of accommodations that she needs. So when she, um, when we go through this, when they're finished, they have um, the, this profile that they've already filled out. So that's really great. I see we're running out of time. So I'll try to rush through here a little bit. And then here is are these blank copies of our profiles that we can use. We have plenty of time, Tony. We've got 15 minutes. Oh, we're 50. I was thinking we were going till four. Okay, great. That's right. 415 is a little bit more. Yeah. So anyway, so uh, yeah. So these uh, profiles are really helpful because if I just wanted my student to well, write out your profile, write out what you need, um, that's going to be a lot more difficult, but that breaks it down for them so that they can see what they uh, use AIM for and what is helpful for them. So that is really um, one of my other favorite parts of this because I don't always come up with things on my own, but it gives me a nice format and template to go from. So I also wanted to point out too, Tony, that if you are with your team and you're working through the IEP team guide, that team guide might be something that you refer back to as well when you're thinking about the accessible format for uh, classes. And going back, it's going to give you some resources to be able to explore um, with your student, even some of the uh, answers uh, that that may be in the other document as well. So they can kind of play off of each other, really. That's right. Um, and Gail, who was kind of our team lead on this project, she suggested too that for some of our classrooms, they might want to go through as a unit in a whole class so that kids are working on this um, together with their classmates and with their peers. And, and that's kind of a fun way to consider this too. I've actually had our life skill um, teacher at our high school decide that she's going to work on this with her whole group next year. And so that's going to be really fun. I just can't tell you every single time I sit down with a student, and of course this is new, but every single time I learn something from them and Sometimes they're teaching me, sometimes we're troubleshooting things and together. 
And the more you use it, the more you learn. And I certainly hope that that my students feel the same way that I do. Um, but just it's just such a wonderful document. And of course, um, I got to work on it, but um, it's it's just really fun. So as we move forward, we go through all these six steps to self-advocacy, getting ready to advocate. You need to know what it is you need first. You need to know what your barriers are. You need to know what you can use and what is helpful for you before you can ask for it, before you can advocate for yourself. Not only is it important to know that before you can advocate for yourself and, and know what to ask for, but you can also use th those opportunities to tell your teachers um, what you've used it for and how it has helped you. Give them some examples. And I think that that is more empowering as well. So first they can determine what is the difficulty? What are they having trouble with? I have a student who has difficulty with um, being able to keep up. She is a little bit slower in her processing and she realizes that and her uh, teachers might be on problem three or four and she's still working on problem one. So how can she use uh, some access accessibility features to be able to keep up? And she's making progress there and that's awesome. In fact, I was so proud of her. I found out this week that she has gone ahead and started advocating for herself before we had even gotten to the, the completely finish that piece of how to do it. And she's very empowered. So that makes me feel really great. I'm just really happy for her. So she's determined what her difficulty is. Then she needs to start figuring out how she can fix that. How can she remove that barrier? What can be done? And I love how in uh, our second story that we have in the guide, the student and the teacher work on that together. It isn't something that they come in and say, this is what I need. They can come in and talk to their teachers and say, this is the problem. This is where I'm struggling. What do you think I could do? Do you have some ideas? And then they can collaborate together and what a great skill that is. So after they decide what they can uh, try to fix the problem, who are they gonna get to help? We have very busy teachers that have a lot of um, time constraints and a lot of things they have to do and it isn't gonna always fall on them. So. What other options do they have as far as support people to help them? So then once they realize who, who they can ask for help, how can they share those ideas so that the teachers will understand? I will tell you, in certain situations, the teachers are not going to always understand and they have to work a little bit harder, but sharing those ideas and learning how to do that in a respectful and collaborative way makes all the difference. So then once they come up with a plan, they have to put that into action. So how did it go when the plan was used? Is it always going to work well the first time? Unfortunately not. And that's kind of what we're learning with some things. But I experience the thing, th same things in my daily life. I've got great plans and they don't always work the first time. And then does that mean that I give up and I feel bad about it and I just stop trying? No. Kind of learn that that grit and that perseverance. And we try to figure out, well, why didn't that work? What could we do a little bit different? And so that's where the next steps come in. So going through those six steps to self-advocacy, I just, I think it's an amazing life skill to learn and um, uh, just an awesome way for our kids to learn how to have that self-actualization that they have a lot more uh, power to solve their own problems than just sitting back and having someone come up with the ideas and the plans for them, and that they can be an active participant in that whole process. And that's a great uh, empowerment issue. So then they have this plan that they can use to write out how they're going to self-advocate and they can develop their own plan. It's gonna be their plan and not someone that helps them. I'm finding that sometimes in some of my uh, the buildings that I work with, um, our my students will say, "Well, this is what the the paraprofessional told me I should do," and um, boy, it is no time like the present to be able to figure out that they can come up with their own plans. 
and they don't always like the plans that their uh, support people have for them and that it's okay for them to uh, figure out and come up with their own uh, plans. So what is the problem? Um, what do they want to advocate for? What do they need to do to fix that problem? And who can help? Because we can call in that circle of support. And our circle of support here has included school counselors. It's included um, our SLPs. Um, I'm on, on the list. Often case managers are on the list. And sometimes parents can be on the list as well. So there's a, a wealth of opportunities for people to include on your team. So then after you go through it, you can go back to that plan and say, well, how did it go? Is it something that that went well? Was there something that I could have done or should have done differently? And sometimes if it goes perfectly the first time, you don't learn as much as you do when maybe things didn't work as well. And so that's a great opportunity to um, move forward and maybe consider some other uh, steps that they could follow. So what um, what are the next steps if it didn't work well? And if it did work well, then what is maybe the next barrier that you need to, to go through? So it's a great opportunity to have this all printed out. And this is something that they can um, use for other areas of their life, like I said, but then the other document that they develop is something that they can use to hand to their teachers and open that discussion so that they've got kind of a template to go off of when they're speaking to them. So these are great guides and great plan uh, templates for them. So Julio is um, the one who talks about needing to advocate for his aim. And there's so many great opportunities um, in Julio's story where he schedules a time and he sits down and he's the one who says to his teacher, um, do you have ideas? Are there things that we could work on together? And I really like that opportunity to jump in there and work, learn how to work collaboratively. And uh, so there's opportunities for uh, students to learn that. And then at the end, it talks about how he went to his teacher and he thanked them for the opportunity to work through that, that uh, challenge together. I love that. I think that that uh, builds relationships. We're kind of where we started, Deb, as we started with using this as an opportunity to, to build relationships. Excuse me. And so we're teaching kids how to build relationships with those on their team. The more relationships we have, the better. So um, I'm going to take a quick sip here. So we end with the acknowledgments of everyone that has contributed. We've had a wide um, group of people that have joined in and helped with this, um, including students who took a look at this guide before we finished it. And we said, well, you know, what do you think? And they were uh, full of great ideas to make it more visually appealing, to change the language so that it was a little more user-friendly for students. And um, it was just a great opportunity to include as many people as possible into this project. I really see this project being used a lot in our district, and I really hope that it will um, as we roll this out and show this um, across the nation, actually. And as Deb said, this isn't anything that's been done before. What a great opportunity that we've had to be able to kind of uh, get the ball rolling and help students not only learn what they need, practice what they need to use, and then learn how to ask and uh, make sure that they have their needs met as they tear down those barriers. So it's been just a great opportunity in so many different ways. And Tony and I have already had the privilege of presenting it nationally to our um, other, uh, the other six states uh, as part of the uh, national cohorts. Uh, we, are present, we are proposing to present in Orlando um, in January for a conference. And I, I encourage all of you to think about what could you do with the documents that we just shared? Obviously, the IEP team guide. But what would you do? What are your thoughts? And as you're considering those, we hope that you will share them. Tony mentioned working individually, one-on-one -on -one with students, but also as part of a group. I'm working with uh, or planning with a group now out of Portland who is uh, all students with dyslexia. 
and we are planning a full day workshop to work through this together. We plan to bring in teachers, um, people who are intimidating so that they can role play and the kids can uh, go up to them and um, practice advocating. I have now interest from a group that works with kids with a traumatic brain injury and helping them to work through and learn what they need and to practice it. And all of these things take different skills from different groups, but it's all about advocacy and helping them to learn and know that they are worth it. And so I'm going to um, show the last screen again, of course, that has our contact information on it. I welcome all of you to contact us with any questions, but I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and ask any of you um, what it is. Uh, if there's any questions in the chat box, of course, we'll uh, respond to those, but what do you think it is uh, that you're going to do um, with this document? So from Jane, Jane, would you like to unmute yourself and uh, talk about uh, what your thoughts are on using the document? Um, yeah, as I said in there, um, I think it's the self-advocacy part is really awesome. Um, I haven't had a chance to talk with any students personally or you know, I mean, it takes a certain type of student that can um, go through this whole process, um, but specifically those ones that are um, needing help with reading and, and that sort of thing um, can probably do that. But I'm hoping that in the districts that I work with that hopefully, you know, come fall, I could do a little bit more um, group presentation to teachers um just in general and especially the um the team decision making um guide that you put together um because I've been starting to bring this up and I think they still don't believe me that you know <laughs> that you really do have to mark that box and we really do have to provide and it's like you said it's one thing just to check the box, but how is it really being implemented? It's like going, it's really sitting down with the team with all those teachers that work with them. And obviously it's easier when it's elementary, but as you get into the middle school and high school, you've got a bunch of teachers. So like, how are they presenting materials? You know, um, so much is still paper and pencil and all that. So um, I think that's the biggest challenge is really getting those people to come up with that action plan of how are we going to put these things into digital form or, or whatever. So, I mean, I'm hoping in the fall to, <laughs> to really get that and hopefully present maybe some of this um, to the district or the SPED team, you know, up front. And so it's not going individually through each IEP when you're well, sitting. Tony, I know that you have presented to your board. Mm -hmm. uh, or at least some of the the folks in administration uh, with mm -hmm. great reviews, I believe. But also, I'm wondering, Tony, you don't do you complete the whole guide in a certain amount of time, or, or are you breaking it up and doing little pieces uh, when you get together with folks? There's really no timeline on it, is what I'm thinking. Would you mm -hmm. agree? When you complete the guide, you mean, or yes. when you? Yes. Oh, yeah. I have never gone through the entire guide mm -hmm. in one setting um, ever. So yeah, it, it takes yeah. time. And that's why I really jumped on Gail's idea of doing it kind of as a group, because it, it takes a lot of time. Um, and you're right, Jane, that not everyone, um, can articulate and be able to present this. I'm hoping that at some point we might have some students that could, uh, use some technology to be able to self-report, um, some of the things that they need. I also am starting to have kids present at their own IEP meetings, those that can, maybe not the whole, uh, I haven't gotten all the way through the whole document with any of my students yet, but to be able to go through that guide, I've had students uh, do like shortened versions for sure. But um, but you're right. We are we are still uh, in the newbie phase of using technology as well, so that it's not all pencil paper 
And some of our teachers are not always on board. And so it's it's kind of, I, I, I was thinking about it today. It feels kind of daunting to be able to impact all of these different teachers so that they recognize, you know, what our students need and how that it's okay, you know, that assistive technology is not a crutch and it's not cheating, you know, that it is something that it is really helpful. And I have to come back and, and recognize I've been working on this cohort for a few years and I need to give them time to uh, come up to speed as well. One of the things that that uh, that Julio story brings up is when students have um, copies of class notes on their IEPs. And uh, I have a student that has has that on her IEP, but she doesn't get them when everyone else has them. And that's the exact same story that uh, Julio um, encounters. And so I have changed the way we put those on IEPs so that it says either in a timely manner or at the same time that other students, you know, get their notes. And so um, it's changing the way we're writing some of our IEPs and we're adding things and clarifying things because you're right. Just because it says it doesn't mean that it's going to happen. So but we are now in our fourth year. We finish it with our cohort work, but our work is not done. So we're making plans to sustain and continue with our work. But right. we're really happy to be able to share with you these documents that we feel are going to uh, help in building awareness with the IEP guide, with our communications page, giving you a place to go for resources and uh, professional development that give you a deeper dive into the areas that you need. And of course, the student advocacy guide um, has just been lit a fire under a, a number of us uh, to think about the possibilities. So we are so grateful that you all joined us today. Uh, the recording will be posted up where? in the OER Commons. And uh, so we invite you to explore. We invite you to come back to us and let us know what you love so we can have uh, make sure that we are on the right track. And uh, yes, keep us informed. If you find a way to use it, please let us know. And please shout out your successes because that's the truest way uh, to bring naysayers on board is to let them hear the stories from our youth and how it impacts their own lives.